Hello, David. Delighted to be chatting with you. Self and Steve Evans here. Hello there. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for seeing me. Hi, David. Uh, good to make your acquaintance. Finally, I've heard a bit about you. I've seen you on Twitter, obviously, uh, and you've made a few comments to various posts recently. And you're in Northampton. Are you anywhere near Steve. Silverstone? Uh, not too to near to Toast, toaster, that is, isn't it? Toaster, can't pronounce that. Toaster, toaster, toaster. Yeah. toaster. Yeah. Yes, my yeah. wife's from around there, but uh, we don't live there. We're in Northampton in Upton. So that's the other side of the uh, the M M one, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. We're right on yeah. the Country Park, right near Sixfields. Oh, I know where you are. Yeah, yeah, that's not far from the rugby ground and uh, yeah, around the rugby ground, isn't it? And the football yeah, we're ground. Near- and the cobblers are at six fields. Rugby guys are in town, I think. Yeah. Terry, you did so you used to work around there, didn't you, for a while? I did. I lived down there um 1986, Artisan Road, the pub on the corner, the Artisan pub, which mm. with Talbot Road. It was sort of <coughs> off just off the high street. The uh the, that lovely park we used to play nine nine hole golf course on there. Yeah, I think I know where you mean. It's not a pub that I regularly use, but I, yeah. I know of it. Maybe shut down now, as you know, 90% of the pubs in the UK. Yeah, I think it's still open. We've got yeah. quite a few pubs still in the Possibly. town. Yeah. Some of them are gone that you'd remember from the old days, but um, yeah, still quite a few pubs around. Funny enough, I'm not actually from Northampton. You might have spotted the accent, is not yeah. local to the town. I'm actually a Derby man. So I moved down here 14 years ago now. So um, it was quite funny, actually, when I told local men where I was from, they all said to me very earnestly, don't pay any attention to the football. This is a rugby town. It's a rugby <laughs> town. And I grinned and said, look, I'm from Derby. And they laughed and went away. <laughs> the good old boys, the cobblers. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. On. Yeah. Talking of the rugby, you work as a chef. And I worked in a pub <laughs> in the town centre right by the Durngate. Oh, yeah. And uh, I was working in the kitchen on my own, and this really huge, massive guy stuck his head into the kitchen and asked me to cook him a steak. And I stared at him like, who the hell are you? What are you doing in my kitchen? I sent him out with a flea in his ear. And um, the landlady came in and said, don't you know who that was? I said, no, boss, no idea. It was one of the Northampton Saints. Oh, whoa. (laughs) Don't argue with him. (laughs) Yeah, they personally knew the owners of the pub, and they used to just get meals and stuff there all the time. And I'd sent him out. I screamed at him, <laughs> threw him out of the kitchen. <laughs> you were doing your right, really, though, aren't you? You shouldn't just be walking in your kitchen, you know, with health and safety yeah. and all the rest of it, you know. I'm the chef, do you? I don't care how big you are. I'm the chef. Get out. <laughs> yeah, it's right as well, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I don't yeah. do that stuff at all. Yeah. Uh, besides cooking, yeah, I'm a big war gamer. Do, uh, oh, do right, war- yeah, yeah. In school, started off with the Warhammer, that sort of thing. I do a lot of Star Wars Legion now and uh, Battletech, which never really been that big in the UK. It's big in the States, but it's starting to grow over here a bit. So uh, I'm doing quite a bit of that when I can find the time for a game anyway. Yeah. On your website, you mentioned a love of science fiction as well, books and films. A favourite author, maybe Frank Herbert, the Dune series? Frank Herbert's Dune, I devoured yeah, as a teenager. Yeah. Um, very enjoyable. I actually preferred the prequels written by his son oh, and no. Kevin. Yeah. You don't say that in any sort of Dune fandom group no. or anything. Throw things at you. But they're a lot easier to read. Frank Herbert's stuff is quite dense. Yeah. So it's not faint of heart. But yeah, definitely um, a Herbert fan. Yeah. I've read a lot of great sci-fi. Recently read some Robert Heinlein. Oh, yeah. And so Catching Classics, mm. which was funny because I was actually compared to Robert Heinlein by a couple of reviewers when they'd read my work. Really? So I was floored by that. That's a bit like comparing a painter to Leonardo. Yeah. yeah. Uh, pretty big compliment. One of the masters. Very much so, yeah. My biggest influence in terms of sci-fi is David Weber. With the oh. Honor Harring series. Yeah. Um, again, a little bit dense, but it flows. Um, you kind of need to understand astrophysics to to get everything out of it. So they yeah. talk a lot about vectors and acceleration rates and light minutes and stuff like that. 
So I've tried to keep that to a minimum in mine. But in terms of content, he's probably my biggest influence. Um, I need to catch up on the On Harrington books. There's a, a few I've not read um, that have come out since I finished reading them. But yeah, he'd be up there with my favourites. Okay. So Star Trek, Dan. Terry, were you, um, you're you into Star Trek. I'm not. But... I love it. I love it. But yeah. my favourite of all of the, the seasons, all of the, uh, the, the, the episodes of Star Trek is Voyager. I think it, with, the, with the original series coming a close second. Mm. What's your yeah, favourite? My favourite probably be Deep Space Nine um, because of the overarching story, the Dominion War storyline. It's more my style, as you'll know from what I've written myself. Yeah, it's A lot more shooting and explosions than Star Trek was known for. Um, the original series, I have watched it uh, as a child. It's a bit dated now. So it was talking about the issues of its time. Yeah. But then all the Star Trek series do. Mm. And the people that enjoyed the previous ones scream and shout about it because, you know, it's left them behind. Mm. So this is the big difference between Star Trek and Star Wars, that age-old argument, which one's better. Yeah. Star Trek is about the issues of today. Mm. Star Wars is about good versus evil. So Star Wars is never dated because that issue never goes away. True. Star Trek it looks dated because they're talking about things that were from the 1960s and well, then and so on. There's one episode where the, um, I can't remember the title of it, but the women basically, they take a drug to look beautiful so that they can go marry a miner in an isolated planet. You know, that that's their, their hopes and dreams, marrying a miner, you know, somewhere in an isolated, ragged place, which as I yeah. say is of the time. Yeah, very much so. And, and they would, hold that up as something to say, well, why is that your aspiration when you can be in Starfleet and you can do things yourself? True. Yeah. The issues of that time, Star Trek now is about the issues of today. Mm. So, you know, it's it's a different discussion. The other thing with the original Star Trek, of course, is they did it on a budget of five ninety nine, a bit like <laughs> that. <laughs> you know, so when they did that episode that was about racism yeah. and Guys that were painted half white and half black. Oh yeah, you know, literally just face paint out of the Halloween shop. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it, it doesn't necessarily age that well. Yeah, but yeah. they they could, and it was for its time groundbreaking, as mm. Star Trek often is. They are the first ones to do something. Mm. But yeah, big Star Trek fan. I'm waiting now for the next episode of Picard to come out on Amazon. Oh, people have been talking about that on Twitter today. People are saying that the, the fact that they swear in it as well seems a bit odd for Star Trek. Gene <laughs> Roddenberry big... wouldn't have allowed that, I'm sure. No, he wouldn't have. No, it is a big departure. And they, they did talk about that when season one of Picard came out. The first sort of episode has got the F-bomb in it. Yeah, and yeah. people are like, oh, what is happening? Star Trek doesn't have language. <laughs> but now it does. Yeah, yeah. So, um, But then it's updating it because people of today, every other word is F this and F that, isn't it? So, yeah. you know, how people are. So let's relate to those people and, and draw them in, the new generation of, of viewers. Does it work? I don't know. I'm watching it. Mm. But then I was always going to. Moving on, we want to talk a bit about your writing. And over the last two years, you've you've had a couple of novels published. Uh, for, forgive me for the pronunciation. Owl Stratagem, is that right? Series? Oh. I said Orle. Ah. I actually pinched the word from Tolkien. It's one of the Valar in Middle Earth. Um, but apparently that should be pronounced Aule. So yeah, there you go. Oh, but it was close. <laughs> you've done better than a lot of people. When they see that <laughs> one on the book cover, they think it should be ruled. They think that's an R. So that um It's the type that's the... used as well, isn't it, David? I think as well. Yeah, yeah, well, that's like computer yeah. print out language sort of looks like. Yeah, well, that's it. But all of us involved in the design were too close to it to see that. Ah. And then I showed it to my wife and she went, do you know what that looks like? And I went, oh, God. And then it's too late because I had the box of books in my hand. <laughs> Done. Oh, well, yeah. it, it's a talking point, if nothing else, isn't it? So, you know. What um, when did your love of writing begun? Was it an early age then, you know, when you started getting into writing and 
Yeah, for sure. As as a little one at primary school, I did the creative writing, uh, and I enjoyed that. Then it kind of fell by the wayside until I was a late teen, and I was scribbling on sheets of paper with a pencil. Um, absolutely terrible fanfic. It was it was shocking. Um, and then it fell by the wayside a little bit again. Then early twenties, I was on online forums as so many were back then and a lot of people were on there were doing it so I'm like yeah I'll get back into doing that so I did some Warhammer 40,000 fanfic which went from terrible to good and I started to write a fantasy novel which has gone somewhere and um, like I say I then moved down here all of that stuff fell by the way so I was running around getting married and things a few years ago would be whoa, seven, seven, eight years ago. I thought, right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it properly. I'm going to look at getting published. And uh, that's when I started it's the, the books that you see there on Amazon are the result of that. Um, funny enough, I said to a friend of mine, you know, I'm doing this. I, I'm going to publish it. He knew a publisher. He said, I'll get you in with him read the reviews of that company, decided I wasn't going to do that, shopped around, and I landed with Cab Publishing. And this is it's kind of a bragging point, but I, sh I shouldn't really brag because it's, it's crass, but I did one query. You know, most writers that have traditionally published do thousands. Yeah. I did one. Yep, you're fine. You're extremely... It's either brilliant or extremely lucky. A lot of people say it's the time and it's what the publisher's looking for at that particular time. And you must have very, meshed together. Yeah, it is very much a case of that. It is being in the right place at the right time. Yeah. yeah. With so many things, you yeah. know, whether it's acting, just going for true, a job in true, the, yeah. or it is, you know, the next Wayne Rooney, it's yeah. timing. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it happened for people like J.K. Rowling. After a few rejections, yeah. for me, I got zero rejections, which is nice. Yeah. Um, that stinks. I was expecting it, and I was going to be shopping around for literary agents, but mm. I didn't have cab publishing. Um, they looked at my query. I think it was two weeks. They emailed me for the full manuscript. Wow. I had six months to deal with the submission with the full manuscript. I had an offer within, I think, two months. Wow. Um, no, what, no, one, see, no one said that to us before, David. We've had a chat with over a, over 100 yeah. writers, about a, roughly about 150. No one has ever achieved that before. I can't well, first, but, yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it is definitely unusual, and it yeah. does get a few sharp reactions when I post on the writers' groups. Jealousy will be. Yeah. A little bit, yeah. that for sure. <laughs> but a lot of writers go through a lot of rejection. Yeah. So I was very lucky to avoid that. But um, what you see there on Amazon, the two books, is actually one book split in half. Okay. It was the thing that the publisher said to me. Um, we love it, but it's too long. Yeah. We don't want to reduce it, so we're going to split it in half. So the first one, Slave Ship, was the first two-thirds of the manuscript. Yeah. The second one, Aurora, was then the final third expanded to the size that it is. Um, that was it confuses a lot of people because they think that's the series title yeah. but it is actually the first book it was conceived as one the next book will have a different title so it won't be the Orlais Strategy in part 3 it will be tentatively it's titled The New Albion Mission which is um, the capital planet of another power in the setting so uh, I'm in the process of planning that which has been very much delayed because of moving house uh, late last year in Christmas, uh, job stuff, life stuff, business stuff. Yeah. You know, so, so I'm sure you know. Yeah, I do, yeah. Is it part of a trilogy or is there going to be more than that then? I know you've it, mentioned the third book. Yeah, it's planned as a longer series. I don't right. know how. Okay. Yeah. I've got a vague idea in my head of where it's going to go and sort of episodes within that that I want to write as a book. But how much of that will merge into one, how much will be separate books, 
I have yet to uh, work out. Yeah, you know, I started reading uh, the first book today, Slave Ship, and it reads to me like a a, a mish between Star Wars and Star Trek, which we talked about. And I didn't realise that I am a fan of military science fiction. I didn't know it before I started reading it. Um, <laughs> but it's the first time I'd seen that genre, I think, you know, on Amazon. I was sort of, I was looking to see what, what I would make of it, but it's, mm. it's immediately made sense. It, it opened up like a, like a, like the, the teaser episode of Star Trek, the two minute bit to get you hooked. Yeah. Yeah. There is definitely an element of that. As I said, I grew up with Star Trek. Yeah. yeah. DNG came out, what, 1989, so I was six. I started watching it a bit later than that. Um, but, yeah, I grew up on that, and then DS9, Voyager. So there's definitely an element of that. And I also remember something my mother said to me. She was a big, big, huge reader, my mum, and a big sci-fi fan, which is probably where it comes from. Uh, but she also loved an author called Dick Francis, Oh, in, horse racing, though, that's totally a yeah. mile away from that genre. It is, millions of miles away, and I've not read any of them myself. But she said to me, Dick Francis had said in an interview or a magazine or something centuries ago, yeah. you've got to grab the reader with the first line, otherwise they just put the book down. Yeah. And it's stayed in my head all these years. Yeah. So I've always tried to do that. There's the first line, pow. Oh, no, I need to know what's going to happen next. Otherwise, they're going to go, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to buy that. Chuck it down again. Yeah. So that that's where that comes from. But, yeah, that Star Trek comparison, I'm not going to be mad about that. Yeah. That, that is good. Um, but that is that is the idea. Grab the reader, get that prologue read, and then think, oh, yeah, I've got to read the rest of it. Yeah. Uh, and hopefully then they will continue to come back. Okay. Just thinking about Dick Francis, I... I... I've, I've got, well, I used to have every single one of his novels, read them all in sequence, over 20 of them. What I always found, though, in every single one of them, I always got annoyed at the fact that, say, the, the baddie is a lord, Lord Fred, let's call him. He, nobody would ring the police with the fact that he's a lord. They'd sort of, you know, yeah. make him pay for his crimes but without telling the police. It was sort of kowtowing as though, you know, to a class society, which I didn't, which just irritated me, to be honest, even though I loved his writing and looked forward to his next book. Yeah, maybe that was the thing when he was young. Yeah, that sort of thing. I mean, it was a different world, wasn't it? Of course, yeah. yeah. Somebody's got a title, they're in the peerage, whatever, nobody even notices. So, yeah, I suppose that hasn't aged very well. It hasn't. And I think as well with me being a scouser as well, I have a healthy disrespect for authority. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably an element of that in there too. <laughs> It's not great tonight. Given the success you've had with the publishers, which was great, and yeah, yeah. you know that must give you, yeah, you, know, you know, a great feeling. Uh, do you feel that you've got anything like any TV rights coming for this, like a Netflix series, perhaps in the future? Is it something you've considered? Well, that would be the dream, wouldn't it? Yeah. To well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, the next expanse. But uh, for me, I'd have to do. I'd have to do it like J.K. Rowling, where she kept a lot of control. Oh. Something that annoys me with adaptations, yeah. uh, and it's mainly film, but TV does it as well, is when they change stuff. And not the stuff that you change because you've got to, you know, because something that's described on the page you can't do with visual effects, so you've got to do something else. But the unnecessary changes, you know, where they eliminate a character or they merge characters or they change a uh, setting or a location or something like that. Um, a case in point is Jurassic Park, one of my favourite books growing up. Michael Crichton. Michael Crichton, yeah. Um, huge fan. Great, um, great writer. Jurassic Park, the book, is very, very different to the film. And a lot of the changes in the film, I can't see a reason for other than we wanted to change it. So it annoys me. If there's a good reason for it, fine. Like I say, visual effects, whatever, it doesn't work. Yeah. Or you just spend too long on something in a book, you know, like The Lord of the Rings is um, very often guilty of. There's a lot of detail, a lot of yeah. scenery setting. You don't need that in a film, so you just skip straight past it. But stuff like um, Jurassic Park, where they change details, uh, like in the book, there's loads of workers still on the island. 
when the dinosaurs get out in the film they've all gone hmm. why change that because now you've got more people for the dinosaurs to eat so that brings in more viewers to the cinema doesn't it and i really want to meet the man who got the book and read the scene where they shoot a velociraptor with an anti-tank missile and blow it into little pieces and then he crossed that out and went no we're not having that in our film that'd be a great scene do you know Visually. what i'm saying yeah but funnily enough that actually comes back in jurassic world they actually use that scene then there's a, a moment when a rocket comes flying over chris pratt's shoulder and blows up a raptor in front of him <laughs> funny enough if you watch the films in sequence after you've read the book you'll see loads of bits from the novel that they reuse later in films oh, yeah, yeah. loads of them and I was laughing my head off because I read them as a kid mm. and then I saw the films and then I came back to them as an adult and read them again mm. so hang on that's in the other film yeah. I know that scene that's where you got that from yeah, yeah. I don't know that's how my head works <laughs> Yeah. I remember reading that myself about oh God about twenty years ago, but I think that the essence of it, you know, the fact that they get the DNA from the the fossilized insects is stuck on the ember of a tree, that idea yeah. was superb. I, I remember taking my son to see that. Alex, he's, he's in his thirties now. I think he was nine at the time, and he used to always sit away from us in the cinema. And I think the scene where the T Rex enters, um, chasing the the bloke, my son sort of turned around and he said, "Dad, do you mind if I sit next to you?" Jumped on, jumped <laughs> right on there. <laughs> It's scary. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're tough at nine, but not that tough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, David, so tell us about your writing routine. For, for this, did you keep like, did you have, create like a Bible or do you have like loads of yellow sticky notes all over the wall for the different character names, places and locations and sequence of events? Yeah, I have got a Bible, as the TV guys call it. I've got yeah. a Word document that is just labelled setting. And it's got details of the powers in the universe, the technology, uh, characters, and sort of what's going to happen in the series. Then for each book, I've created another document, which is the outline. So I plot out the book. Yeah. First, I write a sort of short Cliff Notes version of what's going to happen. And then I plan it out scene by scene. Mm. So if you've read that plan, yeah. you've read the book just you haven't got all the meat on it, it's just the skeleton. So then after I've done that, I can write the book. Doing it that way, I don't get stuck because all the writer's block and stuck for ideas and, oh, God, what do I do? That's all done in the planning phase. So then I'm writing the book and I'm powering through the scene. Yeah, yeah, this is great, this is great. And I think, oh, what's supposed to happen next? I just look at the plan. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Bang, 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 away I go again. Mm. So... I miss all of that. So when they're in the, the Facebook groups, they're putting up, you know, how do I deal with writer's block or how do I deal with this? I've run out of ideas, whatever, and I'm just going, plan it, guys. Plan it first. And I, don't have I totally agree. We, we, we talk with writers, who, they call themselves either plotters or pantsers, some of them right from the seat of the pants. But I think if you've got that framework there, it's like building a house. You've got a solid foundation, haven't you, to build upon? Yeah, and... Okay. Um, Maybe it's the military background. Maybe it's just how I think. But if you don't plan, yeah, you, you're going to fail. You know the the saying is: if you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail. To fail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's absolutely. Very true. And I have tried it the other way. Back in my fanfic days, I did just write with a vague idea in the back of my head: oh, the story's going to go like this. And so I've experienced that side of it, and I kind of understand when people are saying you know, Twitter, writer's group, so on. Oh, my characters don't want to cooperate or my characters have changed their mind and they're doing something else. I kind of get it because I've done that. and gone, ooh, there's a new idea. Bang, bang, bang. And it just happens, you know, it just comes out of your fingers without passing through your head at all. Yeah. So I can kind of see where they get this, this notion from that the characters are actually there and they're doing things and they're just writing about it. But I switched from that deliberately because it didn't make sense to me anymore to do it that way. And so I wanted to work for publication. I wanted that to be, you know, the goal. Yeah. So to my mind, I had to take it seriously, which meant I had to plan what I was going to do so that I was ready to work. It may take me longer, but at the end of the day, you've got a better product. 
The other thing, of course, I've had a lot of people say to me, oh, yeah, but if you planned everything out by the start, you don't have the spontaneous creativity. But I do, because I'll come up with something and I'll go, that's yeah. a better idea yeah. than what I had before. So I'll just change it. Yeah. So when you read the Orle Stratagem, and if you then looked at my plan document, you'd go, hang on a minute. That's not the same thing at all. There's characters in there that never appeared in the book. I just didn't need them. You know, there's, there's events that were added after the plan was made. There's whole scenes that just came around because of the publisher saying to me, you know, you need to insert something else. You need to resolve this that you've left hanging, that kind of thing. So, you know, I, I can defend against those yeah. Yeah. Sort of comment. Oh, yeah, yeah, you've got creativity. It's like being a slave now. It's, it's an organic activity, isn't it? You know, you're breathing life into the characters. You know, they are going to sort of move off and go in a different direction or come up with a new a new slant. But if you've got that basic framework there, I, I think that that's the solid building base. Yeah, I was just going to add there about, yeah, always have a plan, always have a foundation, but don't be afraid to make changes and to change it. You know, modify your plan. Good old army thing that was always taught to me. Yeah, make sure you plan it, but do not be afraid to modify because it, it doesn't always go as you want it. It's the same as well, book writing, isn't it? Yeah, and you come up with new it. scenes. So absolutely. Like um, the army goes, no plan survives contact with the enemy. If, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. So finally from me, because uh, like Terry says, we are running out of time. What advice would you give to a would-be writer, brand new writer coming on it for the first time and he wants your advice? What do you say to him? I would tell him, make a plan, plot out your story. <laughs> yeah. yeah. As we've just been talking about, because it gets rid of a lot of the problems True. that new writers encounter, the writer's block, the suddenly stuck for ideas, I've written myself into a corner, how do I get out of it? That won't happen if you've made a plan, because you've already got a path to follow. Yeah, makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> yeah. right, excellent advice, yeah. But on that note, David, we'll have to say uh, thank you very much. We've enjoyed spending time with you. It's my pleasure. Thanks very much for talking to me tonight. I'm looking forward to seeing the video final product. I'll be out tomorrow. Excellent. Yeah, nice well, let's keep in touch as we have been. Yeah, ping me a message on the old Twitter anytime and uh, let me have a link so all my colleagues at work are keen to see it. Okay, we'll Brilliant. do, yeah. We'll yeah, do. Absolutely. On that note, yeah. yeah. Thanks, thanks, David. Bye for now. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Cheers. It's been a pleasure.